Again, welcome to Operating System CS332 class. And uh, this in this lecture, we're going to cover the operating system overview. So first, an operating system is a program that controls the execution of application programs and also acts as an interface between applications and also the computer hardware. So operating system can be thought of as having three main objectives. One is a convenience. So an operating system makes a computer more convenient to use. And secondly, efficiency. And also operating system allows computer system resources to be used in an efficient manner, such as the CPU memory in terms of CPU scheduling or memory sharing. Operating system again does most of this jobs coordination. And the last is the ability to involve. So an operating system should be constructed in such a way as to permit effective development, testing, and introduction of new system function without interfering with service. So again, those are the three main objectives of an operating system. Yeah, so from this diagram, we can see at the green section, we have the application program, uh, which is normally the user interact with the application programs. So application program will be a special software that perform a specific task. Uh, example can be the Microsoft Word. If I want to create a resume or a document, I can use it. Now, if I want to print my resume, I have to send this information to the operating system. So the operating system again interact with the computer hardware, which we can see on the gray section. So we have the application programs. We also have the library files and utilities. Then we have the operating system. So again, the hardware and also the software used in providing applications to a user can be viewed in a layer or in a higher ranking function as we can see. So the upper layer is the application programs and the most lower layer is the computer hardware. Then the operating system again is the interaction between or the interface between the application programs and the computer hardware. So the user of those applications such as the end user generally is not concerned with the details of a computer hardware. So the end user views the computer system in terms of a set of application. So an application can be expressed in a programming language and is developed by an application program programmer. Now, if one were to develop an application program as a set of machine instruction, that is completely responsible for controlling the computer hardware one will be faced with an overwhelming complex undertaking. Now, to haste this issue, a set of system programs is provided. So some of these programs are referred to as the utility programs or the library files. And these implement frequently used functions that assist in program, program creation also the management of files and the control of IO devices. So normally a programmer will make use of these facilities in developing an application. And also the application while it is running, will invoke the utilities to perform certain functions. So an operating system service, uh, we have the program development, program execution, access to input and output devices, also control access to files, system access, error detection and response, and also accounting. So let's go through the list one at a time. We start with again, uh, the program development. Uh, here we said operating system normally provide a different or uh, variety of facilities and services. Uh, such as the editors, debuggers, to assist the programmer in creating programs. So typically these services are in the form of utility programs that 
why not strictly part of the core of the operating system? They still supply with the operating system and refer to as application program development tools. Now with the program execution, there's a number of steps that need to be performed to execute a program. So normal instructions and data must be loaded into the memory. Then the input and output devices and files must be initialized and other resources must be prepared. So the operating system normally handles these scheduling duties for the user. In terms of access to I.O. devices, again, each I.O. device requires its own peculiar set of instructions or control signals for operation. So the operating system normally provides a uniform interface that hides these details so that programmers can access such devices using simple reads and writes. Also, the control access to files uh, for a file access, the operating system must reflect a detailed understanding of not only the nature of the I.O. device, such as the disk drive or tape drive, but also the structure of the data contained in the files on the storage media. So in the case of a system with multiple users, the operating system may provide protection mechanisms to control access to the files. Also for share or public systems, the operating system control access to the system as a whole and to specific system resources. So the access function must provide protection of resources and data from unauthorized users and must also resolve conflict for resource contention. And in terms of error detection and response, and there's different types of errors can occur while a computer system is running. Uh, so this can include internal or external hardware errors, such as memory error or a device failure or malfunction, and also various software errors, such as division by zero, uh, attempt to access a forbidden memory location, or inability of an operating system to grant the request of an application. So again, in each case, the operating system must provide a response that creates the error condition with the least impact on the running application. And the response may range from ending the program that caused the error or retrying the operation. And the last is the accounting. So a good operating system will collect usage statistics or data for various resources and monitor the performance uh, parameters such as response time. On any system, this is information is useful in anticipating the need for future enhancement and also tuning the system to improve performance. On a multi-user system, the information can be used for billing purposes. So these are the key interface. Again, we have the instruction set architecture, uh, application binary interface, and also we have the application program interface. So instruction set in architecture, uh, normally defines the repertoire of machine language instructions that a computer can follow. Again, instruction set architecture normally again, uh, provides some machine language instruction that a computer can follow. So this interface is the boundary between the hardware and the software. Uh, we should note that again, both application programs and utilities may access the ISA directly. Uh, but for these programs, a subset of instruction repertoire is available, which is the user ISA. So operating system have access to conditional machine language instruction that deal with managing system resources. Application binary interface, 
defines the standard for binary portability across programs. So ABI defines the system called interface to the operating system and also the hardware resources and services available in system through the AIS. The application program interface normally gives a program access to the hardware resources and also services available in a system through the user ISA supplemented with high level language uh, library calls. So again, any system calls are usually performed through libraries. So using an API enables application software to be ported easily uh, through recompilation to other systems that support the same API. So operating system as a resources manager, uh, here we say the operating system again is responsible for controlling the use of computer resources. Uh, resources such as the IO or the main and secondary memories or the CPU or the process execution time. But this control also is exercised in a very uh, curious way. Uh, normally we think of a control mechanism as something external to that which is controlled or at least as something that is distinct and also separate part of that which is controlled. Uh, so for example, a residential heating system is controlled by thermostat, which is again separate from the heat generation and also heat distribution apparatus. So pretty system as a control mechanism is unusual in two respects. Uh, first, again, the operating system function in a way as ordinary computer software. That is, it is a program or a suite of program executed by the processor. But also the operating system frequently controls and must depend on the process to allow it to regain control. So the pretty system sometimes can relinquish or releases its control and it must depend on a processor to allow it to regain control. And like any other computer programs, so pretty system provide instructions for the processor. Now the key difference is in the intent of the program. And the pretty system directs the processor in the use of other system resources and in the timing of its execution of other programs. But in order for a processor to do any of these things, it must cease executing the operating system program and execute other programs. So the operating system again relinquish control for the processor to do some useful work and then resume control long enough again to prepare the processor to do the next piece of work. Uh, we may discuss this more detail again when we cover the CPU schedule. So the mechanism involved in all this should become a clear as our lectures uh, proceed, in, especially if we cover the CPU schedule concept. So we have a diagram here. So this is our computer system. Uh, here, computer system consists of our memory. In the memory, we have the operating system software, normally the kernel. Uh, we have programs and data which has been loaded to the memory. As we said earlier again, uh, for CPU to execute any program or use any data, it can only access them from the memory, not the secondary storage device. So we have the CPUs or the processes. Also, we have the input output controller. So this diagram suggests the main resources that are managed by the operating system. Almost all these resources. 
so a portion of the operating system is in the main memory, which is the kernel. This include the kernel, or sometimes we use the term nucleus, which contain most frequently used functions in the operating system. And also at a given time, other portions of the operating system currently in use. Now the remainder of the main memory contains user programs and also the data. Now the main memory management hardware in the processor and also the operating system jointly control the allocation of the main memory. Uh, as we shall see when we cover again, uh, main memory management concept and also virtual memory. So the operating system decide when an IO device can be used by a program in execution and also controls access to and the use of files. So the processor itself is a resource and the OS must determine how much processor time is to be devoted to execution of a particular user program. Now the evolution of operating system. Here we say the major operating system will evolve over time for a number of reasons. One will be hardware upgrades, or if we have new types of hardware, or if there's a new services to, up, to include it in the operating system. Also the fixes. So hardware upgrade plus a new types of hardware. Uh, for example, earlier versions of Unis and also the Macintosh OS did not employ the paging mechanism. Uh, we may discuss it by paging. Well, excuse me, when we cover memory management, uh, paging and also segment, <laughs> segmentation. Because they were run on a processor without paging hardware. Now, sub subsequent versions of this operating system were modified to explore the paging capabilities. Also the use of graphic terminals, uh, page mode terminals, instead of again, line at a time scroll mode terminals affect operating system design. Uh, a very good example would be a, a graphics terminal typically shows or allows the user to view several applications at the same time through windows on the screen. In terms of new service in response to again user demand or in response to the need of a system managers, the operating system can expand to offer new services. Uh, an example would be if it is fun to be difficult to maintain a good performance for users with existing tools, then new measurement or control tools may be added to the operating system. Also the physics, again, any operating system have faults. There may be faults or errors. So these are discovered over the course of time and physics are made. And the physics may introduce a new fault and also the need to change an operating system regularly places certain requirement on its design. So we can see again from this diagram, we have the stages include evolution of operating system. We went from uh, serial processing, uh, simple batch system, a multi-program by system and also time sharing system. Again, we may discuss all this uh, process. So an attempt to understand the key requirement for an operating system and also the significance of the major features of uh, operating system is useful to consider how operating system has evolved over the years. So we can see Now, so we start with the first one, which is the serial processing. So with the earliest computer from somewhere around late 1940s to mid 1950s, the programmer interacted directly with the computer hardware. So uh, in 1940s and 1950s, when you are a computer programmer, uh, you have a lot of work to do because we have to uh, there was no higher level language. We have to write a code that will interact with the computer hardware. 
when you have a variable, you have to know the address, the location. The, normally today, the operating system may allocate a memory space for us. We don't care about the address, randomly do it for us. Uh, in 1940s uh, programming, we have to, the programmer must interact directly with the computer hardware. So we have to write the code in machine language that the computer will understand. So these computers were run from a console consisting of displaying lights or toggle switches or some form of input device and a printer. So programs in the machine code were loaded through the input device. Normally those days input device is example would be a card reader. So if an error altered the program, then the error condition was indicated by the lights. And if the program proce proceeded to the normal compression, then the output will appear on the printer. So earlier system presented two main problems. Uh, one is our scheduling. So most installation use a hard copy sign up sheet to reserve computer time. And so typically a user could sign up for a block of time, a multiple of half hour or so. A user might sign up for an hour and finish in 45 minutes. This will result in a wasted computer processing time. On the other hand, the user might run into problem not finishing in the allocated or allotted time. And in this case, we'll be forced to stop before resolving the problem. So that's scheduled. Then we also have the setup time, uh, which will be, again, a single program called a job could involve a loading the computer plus the high level language, which is the source program into memory, saving the compile time, which is object program, and then loading and linking together the object programs and common functions. And next we have the simple badge system. So the earlier computers were very expensive. Therefore, it was important to maximize the processor utilization. And the wasted time due to scheduling and setup time was unacceptable. So to improve the utilization, the concept of a batch operating system was developed. So again, we move from the concept to again, the idea of a simple batch system. So to improve, that's to improve utilization. And this was somewhere mid 1950s. So the, the concept was subsequent, subsequently refined and implemented on IBM computers. Uh, by somewhere around 1960s, the number of vendors have developed badge operating system for their computer system. Uh, so here, the central idea behind a simple badge processing scheme is the use of a piece of software known as monitor. So with this type of operating system, the user no longer has direct access to the processor. Instead, the user submits the job on cards or tape to a computer operator who badges again the jobs together sequentially and prays the entire badge on an input device for use by the monitor. So each program is constructed uh, to branch back to the monitor when it's complete processing. And at each point, the monitor automatically begins loading the next program. So here we have the monitor point of view. Here we say the monitor again control the sequence of events. Uh, for this to be so, much of the monitor must always be in the memory and also available for execution. As we can see, again, this is our memory and we have our monitor. 
it has the interrupt processing, the device drivers, job sequencing, and also most important control language interpreter. So the portion is referred to as the resident monitor. Now the rest of the monitor consists of utilities and also common functions that are loaded as subroutines to the user program at the beginning of any job that requires them. Again, the monitor reads in jobs one at a time from the input device, uh, typically a card reader or magnetic tape drive. And as it's reading, the current job is placed in the user program area and control is passed to this job. When the job is completed, it returns control to the monitor, which immediately, immediately read the next job. So this makes, again, the processor utilization more efficient than the previous. Uh, so here we have the processor point of view. And uh, here we say at certain point, the processor is executing instructions from the portion of the main memory containing the monitor. This instruction caused the next job to be read into another portion of main memory. Now, once a job has been read in, the processor will encounter a branch instruction in the monitor that instructs the processor to continue execution at the start of the user program. Now, the processor will then execute the instruction in the user program until it encounters an ending or error condition. Now, either event causes the processor to fetch its next instruction from the monitor program. Now we have the job language, job control language. Uh, so here we say that again, the monitor perform a scheduling function. The monitor perform a scheduling function. So a batch of job is queued up and the jobs are executed as rapidly, rapidly as possible with no intervening idle time. Now the monitor improved job setup time as well with each job instructions are included in primitive form of what we call a job control language. So a job control language is a special type of programming uh, language used to provide instructions to the monitor. So a simple example is that of a, a user submitting a program written in programming language such as uh, Fortran or C uh, and some plus some data to be used by the program. So all the C language instructions and the data are on a sub separate punch card or a separate record on tape. In addition to the C and the data lines, the job include again, job control instructions, which are donated by the beginning and dollar sign. So we have some desirable hardware features and that's include the memory protection, the timer, privilege instructions and interrupts. So as we know, while the user program is executing, it must not alter the memory area containing the monitors very poor. So if such an attempt is made, then the processor hardware should detect an error and transfer control to the monitor. Then the monitor would then abort the job, print out an error message and load in the next job. Now with a timer, a timer normally is used to prevent a single job from monopolizing the system. So a timer will be set up at the beginning of each job. If the time expires, the user program is stopped and the control returns to the monitor then the privilege instruction can only be executed by the monitor. So we have certain machine level instructions that are designed, designated privilege and can only be executed only by the monitor. So if the processor encounters such an instruction while executing a user program, 
an error occurs, causing control to be transferred to the monitor. So among privilege instructions are the input output instructions uh, so that the monitor retain control of all the input and output devices. And the last is the interrupts. So earlier computers models do not have these capabilities and the concept of interrupts. So this feature gives the operating system more flexible in relegation control to and regaining control from user programs. So they give operating system more flexibility in controlling user programs. Now the mode of operation, we have the user mode and also we have the kernel mode. So normally we say the kernel mode is the privilege mode. And now when we are executing a program in the user mode, it means we don't have access to certain resources such as the main memory or uh, other uh, important features, resources. So we normally say user mode is a safe mode because when a program crash in a user mode, it doesn't affect the computer system much. But in the kernel mode, since kernel mode have resources to all the uh, computer, uh, access to all the computer resources, if the kernel mode uh, code a program crash in the kernel mode, then it may affect the computer. So sometimes we say the user mode again is a safe mode. So consideration of memory protection. So if we consider the memory protection and also privilege, privilege instruction lead to the concept of the mode of operation. So a user program is executed at a user mode in which certain areas of memory are protected from the user's use and also in which certain instruction may not be executed. But the monitor executes in a system mode always. So on or what has come to be called the kernel mode in which previous instructions may be executed and in which protected areas of memory may be accessed. So of course, an operating system can be built without these features. But computer vendors quickly learned that the results were chaos. And even relatively primitive batch operating systems were provided with these hardware features. So we should know user mode is always safe mode since we don't have access to certain uh, memories or protective devices. Scanner mode is not safe because uh, any program as, uh, executing the kernel mode can have access to everything. So simple badge system overhead. Uh, with a badge operating system, normally the processor time alternates between execution of user programs and also execution of the monitor. So this can be an overhead. There have been two sacrifices. So main memory is now given over to the monitor and some processor time is consumed by the monitor. So both of these are a form of overhead. That's why this overhead, the simple badge system improve utilization of again, a computer. And here we have the unit programming, uh, which means we have program A, run weight, run weight uniformly and the time. So here we say that uh, the diagram here again shows the situation uh, here where we have a single program referred to as a unit program. And the processor spend a certain amount of time executing until it reaches an IO instruction. And it must then wait then so that the IO instruction concludes before proceeding. We also have the multi-programming. So here we have two different programs combined together running. So this is this inefficiency is not necessary. So we know that there must be enough memory to hold operating system and one user program. So suppose this room for the operating system 
uh, that's if there's a room for the operating system and two user programs. When one job needs to wait for I.O., the processor can switch to the other job, which is likely not waiting for I.O. So this will lead us to the concept of multi-programming. So multi-programming normally allows the processor to handle multiple batch jobs at a time. So multiple programming can be used to handle multiple interactive jobs. Uh, the technique is again referred to as time sharing because the processor time is shared among the multiple users. So in a time sharing system, multiple users simultaneously access the system through terminals with the operating system interleaving the execution of each user program. Thus, if there are end users actively requesting service at one time, each user will only see the average. However, given a relative slow human reaction time, the response time on properly designed system should be similar to that of a game, a dedicated program. So the concept of time sharing can be used to handle multiple interactive jobs. Uh, as we said, processor time is shared among multiple users and multiple users simultaneously again access the system through terminals with the OS interleaving the execution of each program in the short bus or quantum of computation. So this will be the conclusion of our lectures. Again, these lectures we focus on going through what is an operating system again. And also we discuss about different functions operating system uh, can perform and also how the operating system has been involved. The evolution of an operating system from somewhere mid 1940s to present time. So again, wish everybody the best and thank you for your time.